Well, I am so excited today to have someone that I truly admire and respect and have the fortune of working alongside. As a member of the board of directors, uh, as a peer and a mentor, I am welcoming today Ken Asiena to talk not only about her success in her career as one of the few Latinas to make it to the executive levels, but also to just have an honest dialogue with me about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that we see this uh, this Hispanic Heritage Month, but really thinking about it for a full 12 month strategy. So Karen, thank you so much for, for joining in this conversation. I just, I'm so thrilled to be able to have this time with you. Thank you so much, Joel, for this opportunity. You started saying that, you know, it's a great partnership and I, I echo that. It's uh, you're a leader that I admire, that I learn a lot from. And this is a true honor just to be here chatting with you today. So thank you. Uh, Karen, and I promise we did not plan this, um, but apparently teals are color. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Good coordination. Yeah. Karen, you, um, you know, you are part. Uh, unfortunately, of a very, very small group of Latinas. In fact, less than 1% of Latinas ever make it to the C-suites. And you've done so as Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer at Mattel. And I'd like you to just share a little bit about that journey to the C-suites. What were some of your experiences? You know, what did it take for you to get there? Well, I, I have to give it a lot to my foundation, to my family. The values that I grew up with, um, they have always been my compass and that remained through my career. And as I kept having different roles in, uh, you know, in different um, companies as well, uh, definitely a lot of hard work, determination, and a lot of courage. Courage to choose courage over comfort, to set the things that are not popular, to honestly choose not to stay silent, and also to say yes when the opportunities come and, and lean in and, and go with all of your heart and mind with the idea and the desire to, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you ask about representation, and I do believe that, that it is an outcome of so many things that companies society need to look at from a infrastructure system that they need to be in place. And then representation is, is the outcome of that. So, but I, I'll give all the credit to my overcoming, to my family, um, and and really the, the network that I have to, to give me a little bit of that extra confidence to believe in myself. Yeah. Thank you so much. Just wanna just wanna amplify this notion of saying yes having courage and the power of a network. Um, I know I just shared recently about roles that mentors and sponsors have had in my own success journey, but can you talk a little bit about why that network is so important and how did it play a role in, in you know, throughout the many uh, amazing opportunities you've taken on throughout your career? Network, it's, it's, it's crucial, right? Not only because it's an extra layer of advisory, counseling, but also someone that you can be vulnerable and open to say, I need help. Mm -hmm. I need some, some guidance. I need some different perspective that because of all of my history and my different uh, experiences, perhaps I haven't been exposed to. So the network mm -hmm. and the mentors that you have can provide that. But it, it, it really goes back to trust. And, and you really need to build that trust in order to go a little bit further and get that, I get that permission to have that, to have that advice. Um, I have been very fortunate to have great mentors in, in my life. And actually, I remember a phrase from now a true friend. She started as my mentor. She said the phrase that, you know what? If you can't see, you can't be. And that really stuck with me in, in terms of also the responsibility that I had as I started to be in, in senior positions about, I'm also portraying a figure of reality, mm. um, of possibility that some perhaps impossible can be possible. People like us seeing ourselves on those senior positions, but it is important not only to read about it, not only to learn about it, but to see it. And, and that really, you know, 
it stood up with me a lot. Yeah. I, you know, so much great advice that we've had throughout our lives and our careers, but I, I can definitely resonate with that one myself. You know, it is, it is important to be seen as a leader. It is important to see others who look like us in those leadership positions and, um, you know, you're one of the few that have walked into a boardroom, a corporate boardroom. In fact, you know, they just released an updated report and still less than 4% of all corporate board members are Latino, despite the fact that we're nearly 20% of the population. And we both know, because we've experienced it, that there are even fewer Latinas in those boardrooms. So I'm so curious, when you have walked into those boardrooms, what goes through your mind? What are you thinking about? To your point, you know, probably being one of the only, but also this responsibility that you have once you get there. What's what do you think about? I'm not even gonna pretend right now to say, oh, it's so easy and and you know, a walk in the park, it is hard and it is constant, it is to fight that constant internal battle mm. that you have constantly need to prove yourself worth and that you need to, that you're in the microscope all the time, whatever you say, whatever you don't say. So it is really finding an, an, an inner strength and an extra level of resilience mm. to, to self-motivate yourself, to almost be your own observer and your own coach about saying, you got this. Yeah. You've got this, but that requires back to my courage point that requires a lot of courage to really step up on those situations when when you need to think on your feet, when you need to be really authentic, but at the same time, having that pressure on your shoulders that what you're saying and what you're not saying, it matters, perhaps maybe more because back to your point about the representation. So it is a constant battle. It's something that I work on every day. Mm. And and I and, and at the same time, is it's also leaning on your networks and your allies to to get that that sense of um encouragement. But the best ally is yourself. It's so it's so true. I remember I was sitting at a dinner with you know, surrounded by other CEOs, and everyone kept telling me that they're 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 pathway to success was because they weren't afraid to fail. And, you know, I, I remember when it got to my turn to share, I just, I looked around the room saying, what are y'all talking about? I don't get to walk into this space and, and fail. I have to be flawless. That's a baseline, you know, kind of this perfection. And, you know, some of that is, we, we put that on ourselves, you know, that we've got to go in there. We, we hold that burden. We hold that responsibility so high. And some of it is too, you know, that there are others just kind of waiting for us to make a mistake so they can say they tried and uh, are moving on. So I just really want to thank you for being so transparent and sharing that, you know, you do have to be cur courageous in those moments and you just have to be willing to, to be in that space. I think that is one of the first steps, just be willing to be there. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting because I, I think, as we said, both of us have really benefited from programs and people in our lives that have helped us, you know, elevate at each level in our career. And, you know, one of the things I want to talk to you today is about this kind of pullback or diminishing investments or diminishing commitments around diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, particularly for Latinos and uh, Latinas in the workplace, because we have such little representation in executive leadership roles. In fact, we face the largest of leadership gaps of any cohort in today's workforce at 450%. And, you know, I was reading just this week a report from Lenin and McKinsey. And some of the things you and I are sharing that helped us get to where we are, uh, you know, were very rarely available to us in the first place. In fact, career development programs, less than a third of Latinas and women of color had access to that in 2020. Sadly, though, in 2024, less than 25% of women of color in corporate America have access to career development. 
when it comes to sponsorship and the difference between mentorship and sponsorship is important. Sponsors being one of those who, you know, promote you when you're not in the room, have the ability to open the seats up for us. That was cut in half in the last two years. So 16% of women of color reported having access to a sponsor. And today that number is less than 8%. 8% of us have access to sponsors. And mentorship isn't faring too much better. It was 25% uh, in 2022, and now that's dwindled to 15%. So you are a chief people officer. You've held different roles that have led diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts for years. What do you think is fueling some of this pullback? And what are the consequences that you see because of it? It's, um, it's so sad hearing those stats, honestly, it, it really breaks breaks my heart. And I have to start by saying that, acknowledging that, mm -hmm. that it's the reality that we're living in. And, and I think that question has so many answers, right? Um, without getting political, I do think that, you know, the socioeconomical environment it is playing a big role. The challenges, the external challenges, it is playing a big role and we cannot ignore that. And it is a combination of all of these things. But I would say that the main thing is not seeing the value that this has and this brings to the bottom line. The inability that we have in the, like in, in, in especially recently to link the I to to the business mm -hmm. is really is really hurting. Right. And and when DNI is seen as only as an HR initiative or only sits with, you know, the chief people officer team, it's a big mix mistake. Like you said it right. Um right now, Latino market, it's the fifth largest economy in the world. Like, doesn't that blow our mind? Like the fifth largest economy in the world. Like if the Latino market will be a standalone economy, we're the fifth largest economy. And right now, not seeing the opportunities to tap into that, I just think it's a massive missed opportunity. And, yeah. and, and, and you know what? Like I think that we've seen big, important movements in the last, uh, in the last years that, that really are moving the pendulum, right? And they make big swings. We can name we can name so many of those examples, but I do think that right now we're seeing the pendulum move drastically, and I think it's it's really on us to ensure that we neutralize that. But how we're gonna neutralize that is really by speaking the business language and being able to use what it's important to corporations, right? When it when DNI stays on the social justice on it is a nice thing to have or this is just which he will be but it's just going to drive engagement we fall too short like this is a business need that will have an impact on on any any corporation's growth and i actually don't think that that we're seeing that or or, or we've been able to articulate that and i also want to believe that yes dni has it's, it's in measurable retreat, but I have hope that it's not collapsed yet because exactly to the point that, I, that we just make about Latinos is such a growing economy and it's just, it just also younger generations are more diverse by definition. So it just makes business sense uh, and it is linked to the financial success of any organization. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting as, as you're, um, sharing Karen, you know, the, the Latino GDP registered at $3.7 trillion in the latest report. And, you know, as I go around and I talk around the country, I, you know, I want to amplify that this is not some niche market. This is the market of the future. We are the second largest, fastest growing demographic, um, in fact, statistically, since the start of COVID, most people don't know this that the Latino US GDP was the fastest growing economy in the world. So we used to trail behind, you know, countries like China and India. And just since 2020, we are outpacing them. And the entire US economic growth can be attributed back down to the growth that's happening in the Latino community. And it's why salsa, not ketchup, is America's number one selling condiment. 
But back to your point about the business case that needs to be made, as I talk to corporations and executives across the country, I'm constantly sharing with them the data that 78% of all net new employees in the next few years will be Latino. And that, you know, as we fast forward in the coming decades, that the number of Latinos in the U.S. workforce is going to go from 30 million to 60 million, doubling in size. And so give me some tools because I'm out there, I'm advocating, you're in, you're inside. How can I sharpen that even more to make a stronger business case for DEI so that more companies can see it not just as a social benefit, but as an economic necessity? Oh, I wish, I wish we had all the answers, right? About that. But I think it I, I'm gonna go to your point about network and allyship. And I think having true allies within within those positions, starting with our financing team, the CFOs, like we all need to sing the same song. Um, and also with the same Latinas per se, like we need to equip this population with this information, with this knowledge to be able to link, uh, to link exactly to the business case that you're mentioning. And that's why Joel, like, the Latino Leadership Institute is so close to my heart exactly because of that. It's how, how you're focusing on this growing population that you're equipping them and unleashing that network. It is it is so admirable. And uh, I think you are the one who has the answers to give us the tool, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right about what else can we do to, to really ensure that we're translating the DNI again, currency to the business currency. And I think it's on all of us and there's a lot of work to be done. But it's, as you said, it's not only about focusing on, on the, you know, on the programs or on the training programs, it's really how we incorporate the DNI language across the business mm -hmm. that we embed it into the DNI of the of the again of the corporation to that will, you know, that will trigger big decisions and so it, it doesn't sit only with you know the chief diversity officer or just the chro it sits with people big decision makers that are at the table and um and that i believe that that will be the answer how we get that is of course what we're working on it but um i think that could be the unlock i completely agree with you i do think it takes those partners those allies those folks that are going to see it as the business case that it should be seen as. And again, it just reinforces why having you at the table is also critically important, why having uh, many Karens around those tables is going to be critically important. And we're here in partnership, uh, and the Latino Leadership Institute is committed more than ever, despite some of these challenges. I, too, share your optimism for the future. And it's why we're going to continue to not only pursue access to, you know, career advancement through professional development programming, but through network, through mentorship, through sponsorship, through allyship, and really trying to connect people with opportunities in meaningful ways. So I want to conclude with one of my favorite questions I get asked, and that is, what advice would you give young aspiring Latinas out there today in their pursuit? for achieving the career success that you have as part of that 1% club that we're gonna change uh, in the C-suites and in the boardrooms, what advice do you give young Latinas? Um, I'm gonna go back to, to my first answer about staying true to your values. More than ever, being proud and leaning to your identity, it's, it's a power of strength. And it is a source of strength that that will propel that will propel us to go even further. The facts that you share, there are facts, and this is this is a population that is growing, and it will continue to be stronger and stronger. So the more that we lean into that authenticity, that identity, the better, right? Staying authentic to who you are, while combining a great deal of courage to 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 really say yes. For the opportunity to say no when you have to say no, I think uh, that will be. It's easy to say that done, but I will. I will. I would love someone to have said that to me, you know, when I started and and being authentic, 
and stay true to your values, it can be so liberating. Mm -hmm. and, that, and by the way, so relevant on so and so current right now. So yeah, that's that's what I would share. Well, I love that. I amplify that. I honor that. I, you know, without my authenticity, without my values, without my family that you talked about, I know I wouldn't be here in, in doing this work either. So thank you so much, Karen, for your time today. I know folks listening are, are going not only to be inspired, but informed by everything you've shared with us. And um, I'm just, again, very fortunate to be in your orbit. And oh my uh, God, really thank you. you. Thank you, Joelle. And just one last phrase right now is not the time that we can afford to slow down. Yeah. And this is exactly because we're, we're hitting, we're, we're getting the, the, you know, the heat is even, even more than ever. So important that, that we really drive that change. So thank you so much for the invitation. And it's just, it's always a pleasure to have a chat with you. <laughs>